40 days were required and 70 days were required for mourning. 40 days to embalm, 70 days to mourn. Jacob, this is fascinating as we read Genesis 50. And this is Joseph going back to the land of Canaan. Now, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, taking you through the Bible. We're going to study Genesis 50 in just three minutes. Stay there. Corey and Ryan are here too, Corey. Well, I'm going to be taking a look at the burial place of the patriarchs, or maybe I should say the story behind the burial place of the patriarchs. Ryan? Today, Christian astronomer Spike Pissaris joins me to talk about the incredible design of the cosmos. Going to be very interesting. Uh, he is a great guy. And Janice, what are you doing? How great is our God? All right, very good. So take your Bible guide, open it up to today, Genesis 50, 1 through 10. And let's open up the most important book of all, the Bible, and listen to what God is saying to us. Genesis 50, 1 through 10. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him seventy days. Now when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying. In my grave which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. Only their little ones, their flocks, and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great gathering. Then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. He observed seven days of mourning for his father. Genesis chapter 50, verses 1 through 10. Genesis is an amazing book, and we, we come on the last chapter of it today as we begin to exit this book and go into Exodus. Um, but Genesis, we've learned in the first 11 chapters about the beginning of sin, about Tower of Babel, about languages, about the flood, the great catastrophe upon the earth. It's very, very interesting. And today we learn about Jacob's burial. Now, this is absolutely fascinating. That comes from Genesis chapter 50. Joseph was a leader in the kingdom of Egypt. Among other things, this means that he was in control of the future of his father's household. Before Jacob, the father of Joseph, had died, Joseph had taken an oath to bury Jacob in the land called Canaan. Now, the scripture says that when the 70 days of mourning were completed for his father, that Joseph went back to Canaan and there went up with him both chariots and horsemen and was very great, that company. That's Genesis 50, verse 9. This was a significant time in history of ancient Israel. They were in the land of Egypt and would remain there for about 400 years, which was all predicted in the prophecy of Genesis 15. Now, the family of Israel was beginning to grow into a nation of Israel. What we learn from this passage is that God can speak to our hearts based on the future, not just for the present time. So prophecy is much more than just predicting the future, but it's 
talking about the essence of time. And our lives are bound in time, 70 to 100 years and sometimes more. But we need to pay attention because prophecy it covers all of time. And that's very, very important. Take your Bible guide and turn with me to today's passage, Genesis chapter 50. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can call or write to us or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on the guide page or go to BibleDiscoveryGuide.com, BibleDiscoveryGuide.com. Today, as we focus on this, uh, I will tell you, by the way, when you go to Bible Discovery TV or Bible Discovery Guide, it takes you to a place where you can download it as we printed it. So that's important. And thank you so much for your donations. They're really helpful and they keep us on track. Okay. Now, here is the important part to remember. As we focus on this, we need to pray. Father, help us today to pray and understand and learn what you've told us and how you've spoken it. Help us to keep everything in context and not to apply our ideas, but help us to take from your word, your ideas and apply them to our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen and amen. Now with that in mind, let's go to Genesis chapter 50 and let's begin to read. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians to embalm his father so the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him. For such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him seventy days. Now this is important. Forty days were required for the Egyptian embalming. Seventy days to mourn Jacob. God starts by working inside our culture. And we change as he shows himself to us. We change as God shows himself to us. One of the difficulties that people have is when they become Christians, they think everybody should be like they are. The, the problem is everybody's not. And there are many different kinds of Christians around the world who come to know the Lord with many different political ideologies and many different things. God starts by rescuing their life and moves them in closer to him with the word of God. That's why the word of God is so important. But that's what God is showing us here. And Jacob was embalmed in the Egyptian way. It doesn't make it right or wrong. It just means that's how it started. But he was buried in Canaan. Isn't that interesting? So we need to keep that in mind. It's very important. And could, some could say the same thing about Jesus Christ, but nevertheless, we'll get to that later on in the year. Let's go back to the scripture and learn more. The Bible says, now, when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, if now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak to the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, my father made me swear, saying, behold, I am dying in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, go up, bury your father, as he has made you swear. Now, this is fascinating. The people of Egypt knew that Joseph went back to Canaan to bury his father. Very, very interesting. You see, God reminds us of where we came from and tells us where we're going. Now, keep in mind that Jacob is buried there. So God's telling the people of Israel, this is where you came from and this is where you're going to go. So that the, the time in Egypt was just a momentary 400 years, momentary for God, time. Now, this is fascinating because God's time is different than our thinking of time. And we need, through reading the Bible and understanding, we need to think about God's ideas of time. <laughs> because if we try to apply our ideas to God's ideas, that doesn't always work. And that's particularly important in the idea of prophecy. Okay? So keep that in mind. With that, we go on to the third level of Scripture. Verse 7. It says this. So Joseph went up to bury his father. And with him went of course, up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, 
and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all of the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. Only their little ones, their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him, both chariots and horsemen. And it was a very great gathering. And then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan. And they mourned there with a great and a very solemn lamentation. And he observed seven days of mourning for his father. Now, remember this. This is the third point. A large entourage from Egypt escorted Jacob's body as they buried him in Canaan. Now, think about what the Canaanites thought of this. They're living in Canaan. They're starving. It's, and they see this. You see, the Lord always sets us up with the right way to leave this life. <laughs> I want to tell you something. When my father, uh, his body perished back in 2010, I remember thinking it was such a shock because we recorded and then we had to record after he perished. We had to record after him. Very interesting. God had prepared everything along the way. I didn't see it. And I went to call people and, and it had all been prepared. Unbelievable. God keeps us close to him. And we are, he knows the end of our life. He knows the beginning. And he prepares us for everything we're going to go through. So we have to remember that as a Christian, we simply don't feel based on today or live based on today. But we focus our life on what God's will is for us for our whole life. Very interesting. Now, from a biblical perspective, why do you think God made humans and apes look similar? Well, the same thing, same reason I think that there are similarities right through all living things, and that is we see a continuum, if you like, which speaks to us of one creator. If we're an entirely different to every living, other living thing on earth, we have entirely different chemistry, entirely different everything, then we might think there's different creators. All right, so over the last two days, I've been showing you clips of my new interview with Christian astronomer Spike Pissaris. And Spike has a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. He's done graduate work in physics, and he was formerly an engineer in the United States military space program. And today, Spike shares with us some of the evidence that the cosmos had to have been created by an intelligent designer. Here's Spike. Okay, now you also gave a lecture here talking about um, you went outside of the solar system uh, into the entire cosmos, really. You took a look at that and you called that our Goldilocks cosmos. Can you sort of summarize uh, what you talked about? Uh, we talked about um, not only the Earth, but also the Moon, the fact that it stabilizes the Earth's orbit, that it raises beneficial tides in the Earth's oceans. I talked a bit about the Sun and how well designed it is to support life. And this is something a lot of people don't even think about. Um, the sun is really responsible for life on Earth in many ways. It keeps us warm, enough to live. Uh, it provides food for us because plant growth requires sunlight and then we eat the plants and we eat other things that eat plants. And it provides oxygen for us to breathe through photosynthesis in the plants. So directly responsible for life. Um, but even beyond that, the sun is very unusual in its characteristics. You sometimes hear people say it's just an average star, not a big deal, well, that's not true at all. An average star would be a red dwarf because 75% of stars are red dwarfs. Uh, red dwarfs are small and cool. So if we were orbiting an average star, it would be a red dwarf, small and cool. We'd have to orbit it very closely just to stay warm enough to survive. Uh, and we're so closely, in fact, we would we'd be tidally locked around it. So the same side of the earth would always face it. So one side would roast, the other side of the earth would freeze. Again, life would be very difficult. And also red dwarfs are very unstable. They flare frequently. They would sterilize any planet caught in the path of a, an eruption. So we should be thankful we don't orbit an average star because it would be a red dwarf and that wouldn't be good. But even among higher mass stars, the sun is very unusual. And without going through everything I talked about earlier, the one thing I like to focus on is that even solar type stars, the stars that are most like our sun, turns out have super flares about once a century. So a super flare is about 10 million times greater than an average flare that our sun puts out. Wow. So and once every 100 years is 
scarily frequent if you think about it you know, on a large enough time scale. Um, any planet caught in the path of a superflare does not do well, yet the sun has never emitted a superflare. Even though solar type stars do this frequently, our sun never has. So even among the class of stars that it's part of, our sun is apparently unique as far as we can tell. Hmm. That's because it was designed to support life on Earth, as Isaiah says. You know, when the Lord says he formed it all to be inhabited, speaking of the Earth, not the sun, but the whole system. Hmm. Uh, looking farther out in the galaxy, you, you can argue, as many have, that our position in the galaxy is ideal. Even from a secular perspective, uh, most places in the galaxy you don't want life to be because, like at the center of the, of the galaxy, there's going to be supernova explosions and gamma ray bursts and neutron stars and all sorts of nasty stuff that you don't, don't want to be in your neighborhood. Uh, we are about halfway out on the disk of the Milky Way galaxy, mm -hmm. and which is ideal, turns out. Amazing coincidence there not only for life to be possible here, but also to give us a better observational point to see the rest of the cosmos. Because if we were more inside of a spiral arm, we'd see stars in all directions. We wouldn't be able to perceive the deeper universe from our vantage. Wow. Plus we'd be subject to more radiation from that amount of stars around us. So we're at the ideal place in our galaxy. And even within that location, we're ideally placed right outside of an arm, not only to protect us from radiation, but also so we can see deeper in the universe in an ideal vantage point to perceive more of God's glory in the deeper cosmos. So I really, really want to thank Spike for spending time with me and taking the time to answer all of my questions. And if you want to see the rest of the interview, then get a hold of this new resource, which is once again called A World by Design 3. Now also, please check out Spike's website at creationastronomy.com because there you can also get a hold of his three-part video set called What You're Not Being Told About Astronomy. Creationastronomy.com. It is an, he's an excellent guy. And, he really uh, is. It is really good. I look forward to talking with him in the future. It's going to be really great. So that's good. All right, Corey. All right. Well, the Cave of Machpelah, the burial place of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, you know, not a lot archaeologically is known about the current place identified as the Cave of Machpelah, but there is some interesting history, so let's jump right in. Genesis 23 recounts a land purchase agreement between Abraham and Ephron the Hittite. Their agreement took place at the city gate of Hebron to be witnessed, and resulted in Abraham's ownership of a field with a cave in it. This cave served as Abraham's family tomb and became known as the Cave of Machpelah. The Bible records the internment of at least six people here, Sarah and Abraham, Isaac and Rebekah, Leah and Jacob. After these six, it's often assumed closed for burials, as the internments of the sons of Jacob are not recorded, only that of Joseph, whose mummified body was buried at Shechem on land that his father Jacob had purchased. Today, there is a famous site in Hebron that claims to be built on top of the Cave of Machpelah. The foundation, walls, and floor of the interior courtyard of this building is believed to be the only fully preserved building of Herod the Great. The construction and design style seem iconically Herodian, and the similarities with Herod's Jerusalem temple are obvious. Herod's structure was a massive roofless enclosure that may not have had an entrance. The ones there today were cut much later. Over the millennia separating Herod from us, various rulers and conquerors have altered and added to the structure of Machpelah, developing legends to go along with it, like it containing the secret passage to the Garden of Eden, being the burial site of almost anyone important, like Adam and Eve, Moses and Zipporah, and more historically plausible, the sons of Jacob along with Esau. Modern research has not been allowed to truly commence here, but underground exploration and modification has occurred in history at least once in the Crusader period. The closest the site came to an archaeological investigation was in 1967. Secretly, a 12-year-old girl was lowered through a small hole armed with a camera and a flashlight. She explored as much as she could, taking measurements and notes. She did not find the bones of the patriarchs, but the internal masonry seemed Herodian and she described large stone slabs. It remains unclear if the slabs were mounted to the wall or if they concealed chambers. So there we go. The story behind the Cave of Machpelah, both the biblical story and some more modern stories. Now, as we, well. we, we learn a lot from the 
death and the burials of these uh, great uh, patriarchs. What's interesting to me is Leia appears to be the rejected wife at the beginning for lots of reasons, but she's the one buried in the cave of Macpella. Yeah, and that, like, we don't know. That may have been a legal arrangement that Jacob had entered into, or he may have been honoring her as the mother of most of his children. We don't know, because it's also interesting that the only son of Jacob that we know for sure was buried in the cave of Machpella was Joseph, who was Rachel's son, not Leah's son. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Was it because she was the first wife? Was there some sort of legal arrangement or was it honoring her as, as the mother of the firstborn children, even though that firstborn son didn't necessarily also get buried in the cave of Machpella? It's very, very interesting. And we'll learn about all these details. Uh, when we do get to heaven, it's going to be very exciting. Uh, that, that's one of the things I'm going to look forward to, actually. Uh, There's still learning to happen. Uh, always, always. Always learning. Yeah. Always, right? All right, Janice? Right, and that's really one of the reasons why I titled my segment, How Great Is Our God? Because he really is great. And, you know, as you're studying through, there's just so so much richness in the entire Bible. But as we go through the Old Testament, I'm always fascinated that, you know, this is our 34th year, Rod, in broadcast going through the Bible. And every year, things jump out, things are illuminated through God's Holy Spirit. And, and it's never dull. It's never boring. We're always learning and, and always active. So we're so thankful that um, you're joining us again this year. And maybe this is your first time this year. So welcome. We're so glad that you can come along and discover the Bible with us this year. Now, I was looking at this chapter of 50. Um, Joseph's father has died. Uh, Jacob, Israel has died. And, and he spoke to his son Joseph and said, I don't want to be buried here in Egypt. I want to be taken back. I want my body taken back to Canaan. And so the usual Hebrew tradition was to practice same day burial without embalming. But because they had to take his body on this journey, he would be embalmed. And this, I am not a, um, what do you call that? A, a, um, an Egyptologist, Corey. And I don't study history in the same way that you do, but I do know that Egyptian embalming takes 40 days and it was normally done by the priests. And if you see here, his was not done by the priests. Joseph called on his physicians to do this. And I think that had more of a spiritual ramification in it uh, than, than not. That's my own personal thought. That's not really where I'm going. I was kind of building a branch on that right now. But what I want to talk about is something very simple. And I really hope that I'll be able to articulate what I mean. And here it is. Egypt prepared or embalmed dead bodies in death for life. And embalming means preserved or protected. And I got thinking about that. God, when we accept the Lord Jesus into our life, God is about life. And what he does in life and in our life is he preserves us from death and gives us eternal life while we are living. And he is our protector. He literally surrounds us as his children. When we come to the Lord Jesus, we accept what he has done for us on the cross that is covering the cost of our sin. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. There was only one perfect person that could do that, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And he did that for us. He paid the cost of sin. He took that away. So what a reverse look at when we look at Egypt and their practices in death, preparing the body, embalming the body to somehow transport that into life where God brings life. God is life and he surrounds us and if you want to say he embalms us, he is the epitome of life who preserves us because of what he has done, because of who he is. He is life and he becomes our protection from the evil one. And so this is sort of a, a diversion, guys, from, uh, from this scripture. And yet it just kind of opens up 
a different perspective on looking at the greatness of God and the truth of God and how he is our deliverer and the difference in a culture who did not, who practiced their God was their Pharaoh, right? And, and, and we, we're going to learn more about Pharaoh as we go along here. But I just thought it was a really kind of an interesting, different spin. And I hope <laughs> that I was able to accomplish what I had hoped. Mm-hmm. Mm, so interesting. Sure. Absolutely. You know, a great social media platform is called Rumble, and rumble.com has our programs, this program exactly. And so I want to encourage you, if you ever want to find a place like YouTube or a place like that, but it's different, go to Rumble and look for Bible Discovery TV. Our programs are on there, our 24-7 live stream is on there. I think you'll enjoy it. Today we pray, Lord, my desire is to have a life that is satisfying to you. Help me to know what that means. 